Welcome to the Waiting Room Revolution. We are excited to have Sandra Holdsworth on our show today. She became very familiar with the healthcare system when she received a liver transplant in the mid 90s, and since then she's had experience with other chronic health conditions. We talk about how to navigate the system, what she's learned as an outspoken patient advisor, and how our seven skills apply to those in the transplant community. Hi, I'm Xian Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Hi, Sandra. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I look forward to uh, our conversation. Uh, yeah, I was fortunate that, you know, I have survived my illnesses, but not without waiting in many waiting rooms and without a lot of heartache. And since you brought up waiting rooms, maybe let's start there. I'd love to hear your reaction to the Waiting Room Revolution podcast so far. What do you think about our mission to provide information directly to patients and families to create system change. The one thing that I thought that I really liked is that, you know, the frustrations that you were having because um, you were going to the doctors and telling them about palliative care and that, right? But now what you're doing is like, there's, there's, there's nothing greater than an empowered patient who's taken responsibility for their health care. And I, I think healthcare providers need to see that as a benefit and so the fact that you're now saying, well, you know, I think, uh, Sammy, you're quoted as saying, you know, hey, we need to give this information to the patients. Mm -hmm. And a lot of patients don't know. I mean, you talked about, uh, I'm sorry to bring it up, but your friend Jerry, mm -hmm. well, actually I have a friend named Jerry who actually got a transplant. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the suffering that was done there and like, just imagining like, you know, someone thinking that how they're going to die and, you know, not being able to breathe. So you know, those kind of things. And then what you're doing is by, you know, you're putting it like having the people like be, be prepared, be informed, um, have that confidence, I like calling it empowerment. Mm -hmm. And then what you want. One of the things I was wanting to, to talk to you about, um, but I was a little bit nervous yeah. given that you've had lived experience, was this whole <laughs> idea about what conversations happen and don't happen as someone like you or patients that I've had waiting for lungs or other organs um, are in that period of time before they know whether or not they're going to get a transplant. And I guess I'd love to hear from you. Um, no, what what happens and doesn't happen to prepare someone for that other road, that just in case you don't get the organ transplant? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about holding that space while your illness gets worse and you're either going to live or die? Yeah. So first of all, my experience was 25 years ago, so I'm hoping it's changed. If you're going to if you have cirrhosis and we need to get you a transplant. But I don't know if my team ever actually said, you're going to die. You know, like, I don't think they ever actually said that. And this is, this is one of the things we used to talk about, especially, and I'm going to go back to the organ donation. It's like this myth that if people show up at a hospital that, you know, the doctors aren't going to save their lives because they're thinking of build organ donation. Well, that is so far from the truth. Doctors want to save lives. And that's one of the reasons why we could never get doctors to talk about organ donation before. Because if they didn't save the life, they were out the door trying to save someone else's. Like it was a revolving door of like trying to help people, right? But it wasn't until, I think it was around Christmas Eve. So I went on the list in August. I was diagnosed in 92. I went on the list of August of 96. And it wasn't until that Christmas that I realized, wow, like, I could really die. And, and then it was even the night of my transplant when I was in the hospital and I was thinking of the donor family and wondering how they're doing. And I was thinking, you know what? I think I'm okay. I think like it sucks and that, you know, I don't want to die. I still have a lot, but I'm at peace now. And it was this feeling that came over me that I was okay. And ever since 
I'm more afraid of falling on my butt and not being able to get up than I am about dying. Yeah, I guess the, what I was alluding to is this idea that my experience has been with patients who have uh, not been eligible for transplant is that leading up to that decision, no one really talked to them about the fact that their underlying illness was progressive and that it was entering into an advanced stage and preparing them for the fact that if a transplant doesn't happen, that the condition is not just chronic, it is progressive and it will continue to get worse. And there was no attempt to infuse a palliative approach um, until they pulled the rug and said, no transplant is possible for you. We're gonna transfer you to palliative care. And it really felt like a slap in the face, like a shocking um, revelation that patients and families, you know, feel very disgruntled about because no one really mentioned to them before, uh, yeah. that, you know, that their condition was going to get worse and worse. And, um, you know, it's worthwhile us trying to treat your symptoms and make you the best that you can be, whether or not you get a transplant or not. There was just a whole avoidance the, the conversation centered solely on transplant not yeah. the other road because it's the wrong people that they're talking to there has to be another team so um so i also worked at hospice muskoka for two years and i learned a lot there and one of the things that i learned because even though i was just in administration and fundraising i got really involved in the palliative care stuff i was really interested in it and one of the things i was learning is that the referral time is always too late and so the girls that were working here, like they would go into the hospitals and find out where people are and trying to refer them. But at that time, it's still too late, right? So that's why, you know, like either the patients have to ask, but like, like it's also hard for patients to realize that they could die. But I think that they have a right to maybe, and this is where not one team or one doctor can do everything, but it sounds like to me, the transplant team in, in particular, or the cancer or whatever, needs somebody that will then take the patient to the next step. And that's for anyone, even someone who's on the list, because my, many of my friends have died on the list, mm -hmm. right? Many of my friends have got to the table and it rejected. Mm -hmm. So, and they need to be prepared and their family needs to be prepared. And one of the things that we're missing out on here too that I made a note of, when I was waiting for my transplant, it was more harder on my family and my friends than it was on me. I mean, because I, I lived the experience and I was going through it. So it was like, it was almost like, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but for them, all they saw was their daughter dying or their friend. Like I had tan and I was losing weight. So everyone thought I looked great. And then I also looked pregnant. So, you know, and I wanted to have a child. So everyone thought, you know, look at Sandra. She's like, lost all this weight. She's got a tan. She's pregnant. Where in the reality is, was no, I have cirrhosis and I'm dying. Right. So, um, yeah, no, see, there's a, there's a, there's a gap there. That's all I can say. Yeah. There's a gap there. I, definitely not happening that I know of. Sometimes families are suffering on the side wings because mm -hmm. the patient we say is the star of the show. Um, yeah. but the families are in the shadows and uh, the families and friends and they're seeing what everyone is not talking about they're seeing yeah. that loved one is changing yet we're you know watching the person decline and decline while we're waiting on the list as you say um, yeah. I would suggest that the reason why you um, acknowledge that your family was having a, a worse time than you were while you were waiting is because they too were left in the dark and scared out of their mind right so but yeah no I agree with you but I'm just saying like the navigation is also like you talk about my mom right like trying to navigate the healthcare system when you're dealing with um, home and community care and you're dealing with specialists and your doctors and and even even for me, like, you know, when there when there's not an EMR that's being shared, like yeah, you can appreciate how many doctors I have. 
mm -hmm. right? And I go to the EMR, uh, to the emergency here for something. And I give my family doctor, my liver specialist his name. And um, that information, they don't even know that I've been to the hospital, yep. but they see my blood work. And in this case, I had uh, um, a nosebleed that lasted almost three days. It ended up in emergency surgery, right? And my hemoglobin like went down to 70, so 70, right? So my team's looking at that and they're like, oh my God, get her in. But I'm like, well, didn't the, didn't the hospital tell you, right? And I'm not blaming like, but, but it's just the way the system works, right? But as a patient, I'm like, well, why did you ask me for my family doctor, my specialist, if you weren't going to share the information with them? Yeah, that's you, something you, else. <laughs> um, someone like you have, who has faced and is facing multiple conditions would have lots of different doctors and nurses in, uh, wrapped around you. Um, in mm -hmm. our podcast episodes, we talk about um, uh, tag your it, which is really this idea that the patient or someone in your um, life needs to almost take on that navigation role um, in a big way. So there could be navigators who are assigned in the system, paid people, but there's yeah. also crucial need for a family or the patient being their own navigator so that the right hand knows what the left hand, and in your case, the right foot and the left foot and the right ear and the left ear. <laughs> you get my point. You have so many teams. Yes. It's true. Someone like you would be at risk of having all your teams sort of not knowing what each other's doing. If I just follow up, it was kind of like, it was just like the idea of, you talked about having a lot oh, of- yeah. um, uh, feeling uh, the challenges as a, as a patient and family and what, and, well, you know, just having different things. And I'm just wondering if you ever felt like there were times where you didn't have all the information and you really needed to take charge to get that, you know, if you were a different kind of patient, like maybe you would have got lost in the system or maybe you already felt lost in the system. No, I took action right away. You got to appreciate too. I was diagnosed in 92. So the internet didn't come out till 95. So, and then when I reached out to the Liver Foundation, they had um, one research paper, one news article on my disease. So, no, I, I'm definitely, so um, this is one of the things I talk about, right? It's, there's two types of patients. There's a patient who wants to know everything and wants to know all the details. And there's one other, the others that are like, wake me up when it's over. Right. And I think we're past the wake me up when it's over because you need to take responsibility for it. You got to be prepared. So like I keep a journal. I write. So I put the date, the date I went to the doctor and I have my questions. Right. And then uh, I write them and I kept it. I still have it. The other thing that I do and I encourage everyone to do and is bring someone with you. Um, so bring someone with you if that's my, was my spouse or if it was a friend or, uh, and, and now with my mom, like, I, I don't think any doctor should turn down having, um, somebody bring someone in the room with them. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was very important because especially when you're giving news, right? Like, let's say you have to sell someone, they have cancer. Well, you watch the movies, right? The person says you have cancer. And the doctor's talking and what's going on with the patient, blah, blah, blah. They don't hear you. Whereas a person in the room could say, okay, this is what the doctor said. And then the patient's probably hearing cancer. I'm going to die. Where the family member is going, no, he listed like three types of treatments for you, right? So, um, and also to the other one point I want to make, it comes back to navigation. So we need more navigators in the system and we need more and I'm, 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 I know that this is something that's coming, and, but we need more information available to people and a navigator, like cancer. I'm pretty sure the cancer care has navigators, but more navigators of helping people, especially those with chronic illnesses, work their way through the system, which is really a jungle, to be honest with you. You know what? Um... I actually have very high expectations of my colleagues, um, my doctor colleagues. Um, two things I want to mention uh, is what you just said right now, the need for navigators. And um, 
what you mentioned before about needing a special team, uh, a palliative care team that is available to people who are in a situation um, where, you know, they're in a progressive illness. I guess what I wanted to say was, and to hear your thoughts that, you know, I truly believe that um, if we trained doctors and nurses to be able to care for their patient population along the entire illness journey, um, you know, balancing hope, uh, but also infusing a palliative approach that we probably wouldn't need to rely so heavily on palliative care specialists. I feel very strongly that palliative care should not just be the skill set of a specialty team. That oh, no. someone is caring for someone who's headed for a transplant, a transplant doctor, a critical care doctor, um, a, a hepatologist, a family doctor, all of them should be sharing a palliative approach uh, for someone like you, Sharon, and other people who were waiting on the list. I, I think the idea of needing to find faster, faster referrals to palliative care is not the answer. I think the answer is training up doctors and nurses to be able to do it. Maybe not even ever labeling it. It's just part of caring for patients with progressive liver disease. Um, yeah. so, you know, and then navigation, you know, call me crazy. I do a ton of navigation in my role. Um, yeah. It's actually about 90% of what I do as a palliative care doctor. I'm constantly helping people understand where they've come from in their journey, where they're at and where they're going, what, how to access resources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not rocket science. Again, I have high expectations of my colleagues to be able to provide some of that navigation. And so in a way, I feel like, you know, focusing on navigators or foc focusing on faster and furious referrals to palliative care teams, they're sort of band-aid solutions for the bigger, bigger, bigger problem of our training. So whatever you guys think, and I think you're doing a great job here, how do we get that to change? Then I, I, I welcome it. But it's just, it's, it's a whole different mindset. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we've got to change the language. We can't be saying palliative care. People think of palliative care and they think of end of life. And we have, first of all, that's the message that we have to stop. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we were trying to do with this podcast, right? We wanted people to not be scared of the word palliative care or to change the language around it and realize that life and death coexist, that hope and preparedness can coexist, and that by preparing, you can live life to its fullest, even while living with a serious illness. So, um, but one of the things that I wanted to address, so you talk about me having a liver transplant, but within the transplant community, I don't understand um, why palliative care isn't being used on people who are waiting for a transplant. I mean, we basically got sent home to die and hope and hope, as you said, in your, you know, the, the two roads, either you're hoping, but then you're facing reality. If a donor doesn't come, what's the plan? So when you're talking about um, palliative care and, and a lot of times, I think one of the reasons why people aren't considering it for those people who have chronic illnesses is because it's also followed by end of life. And we need to change that language so that we're talking about palliative care in one hand, and then we're talking about end of life in the other. Um, so, um, so that's something that I'm working on changing. And so then with my Crohn's disease as well, so um, that was really difficult because I lived for as long as, or and even longer with Crohn's disease. Um, and there isn't a cure for that. And what happens, a lot of people, they go in and they get resections done and they have the bowel removed that's damaged, but you know, they're, they're still not 100% well. And they're, so like, how can they have, you know, palliative care or even like a lot of times too, um, rehabilitation. 
I think a lot of times that's not considered. We often talk about um, cancer. We have a lot of cancer stories because I'm in the from oncology. But you have uh, some experience with chronic kidney disease, and, you're, and you talked about your father. So I'm just curious, knowing what you know now, and and the experience of uh, uh, of kidney disease, and the intersection of that and palliative care. I mean, do you think like how would you envision, or do you feel that it's easy to infuse a palliative approach there? I mean, we kind of touched about it at the beginning, but I'm just trying to ask the question a little bit differently, um, because like, what is that? You know, I think Sammy was trying to say, what is that like, and you know, how do you have those conversations? Because it is kind of a long road. There is dialysis. There are op- there are treatments, but it's a little, it's not like cancer where, you know, at some point they can't do any more chemotherapy, right? So what does that look like? What does early palliative care look like for chronic kidney disease? I guess that's my question. I would, uh, I would say when I'm on dialysis that I would say, let's talk about palliative care and what does that mean? Um, I actually had a liver transplant friend who was a mentor of mine and she chose to die instead of going dialysis. She says, I'm so sick of this, right? And, you know, she had got to do her stuff. And I, I was able to actually have a conversation with her where I could say goodbye and tell her how much I respected her and that. Instead of like, you know, I have a couple other friends that are waiting that, you know, they go in and then, you know, the kidney's not, not good for them. And then I know every day that goes by that they're going to pass, right? because their heart will stop, right? And so, um, no, I would definitely bring it up, but I'm definitely after this and watching more of your work because I am involved in research, I am gonna start talking to the transplant communities about, you know, what are we doing? And there was a girl that, that I work with that her husband ended up passing and she said there was nothing for his like he's like you're not getting the liver go home right and I remember her mentioning the fact that there was no offer of like what we should be doing so there's obviously as I said a gap and this is really crucial especially in Canada right now with medical assistance and dying being legal and um you know with no judgment whatsoever no what what I fear is that these people who have the carpets ripped from underneath them, like the gentleman that I spoke about yeah. in the past, um, feel like they have only one option, and that is to uh, get a medically assisted death. They have, yeah. They're have they standing there on the edge of a cliff. Um, no one told them that there was any other way to make them comfortable other than getting a transplant. They don't get it. And then they feel they're either going to dive off the cliff or get assisted dying. They have been neglected in a way. Um, Their needs for information, their needs for a roadmap, their needs for um, quality of life focus have gone um, unaddressed. And so I, I, I worry that people in those scenarios are more likely to feel like medical assistance in dying is their only option uh, when it's not. Uh, People who don't get transplanted, whatever chronic and progressive illness they have, there are ways to try to help people be the best that they can be along the entire journey, whether they get transplanted or not. they don't get a transplant that just continues. Uh, There is beautiful care that is available. Um, Medical assistance in dying is an option, but it shouldn't be the default option for people who have been left in the dark. Well, I'll use the example of my father. Okay. So my father had a heart attack. He didn't even know he had it. Um, 2014. So he went in, they they had a quadruple bypass and had a pacemaker. Then he was, I don't know if it was around the same time, but he was also told he had chronic kidney disease. And my dad used to joke, they basically think, you know, eventually he's just gonna die. Like there's not really much you can do, right? So he knew that, but you know, but he was deteriorating, he was sleeping more and that. He also needed to have leaky valves fixed and they wouldn't do it because he was at a risk. So he has chronic, chronic kidney disease. So on his 85th birthday, he's not feeling well. He's not doing very good. We go down there. 
We take him into emergency. He has delirium. The doctor came in and said, look at, you know, you know, your, your kidneys are shutting down. You have cirrhosis of the liver. You have colon cancer. We can't do anything about it. Your heart's a mess. Basically, we can't do anything for you. And then he said to my husband, well, looks like it's up for me, right? And anyway, so we weren't in palliative care because that was full. We didn't get to a hospital because there wasn't a bed available. But the very, very kind palliative team allowed my dad to stay in this room by himself and provided palliative care. Mm. And he was awake till the Saturday talking, smiling. And then he says, Sandra, I'm going to sleep. And he went to sleep and I, I, I was with him for four nights straight. Mm. And the breathing, as you said, like, you know this, you probably watched this. The breathing was slow. He wasn't in any pain and it was peaceful. I was holding his hand right to the very end. Um, so that was a good experience. Like it was sad, but it was a good experience. But I bring this a lot because I had a book full of doctors that I had to contact to say that he passed. Um, and then like, so there was no easy way to do that. And I'm thinking the hospital that he died at, I said, don't you notify all the doctors? You're the one who booked all these appointments. And they say, no, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. So this is a point where you're, what you said, we do need a navigator. And I'm finding I'm doing that with my mom as well. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, is when I started looking at my dad's files, there was a scan that showed that he had cirrhosis of the liver. And I don't know if my dad was told. Mm -hmm. And if he was told, he didn't remember. Mm -hmm. But, you know, anyway, it's just, it was so frustrating. But it's just, the whole point I'm trying to make is it's a lot of information. It's overwhelming. And as you, you've identified the kind of person I am, and you met Julie Drury, who talks about her binder for her child, right? You know, I have all those notes and I have access to my dad's file and stuff. I could see the blood work right away. So, but others, they're, they're going to be overwhelmed because they're yeah. also dealing, I was dealing with my dad dying. Yeah. Right. Like he was lucky to have you by his side. Um, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I figured what, you know, for all the things he did for me, it's the least I yeah. could do. Right. It was an honor to be able to, to be able to do that. Sandra, this is might be a, um, a little bit of a, not sensitive, or maybe a little bit of a scary question I'm going to ask you, but, you know, uh, of course you would be aware that every year a person lives with their transplant. Um, you alluded before to the possibilities of, you know, the kidney disease getting worse or developing some other malignancy or, you know, the list is long. How, does your mind ever wander into the future and, um, you know, think about your own situation? And what's that like for you to just live in like, complete, in the moment? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking like just living so woke to like, I don't know what I am going to die from. I am yeah. healthy and well right now. Um, in your situation, you have um, the probability of things going certain ways, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't know, how do you live and do all that you're doing um, when you're walking like sort of a, a tightrope in a way? Yeah, well, when first had my transplant, I was like, I'm going to do as much things as I can. Uh, so the first time I went to Cuba, and then uh, I've attended seven world transplant games, all eight Canadian games and six American games. And I've done a lot of things. But then I spent a lot of my hours making money. Then I realized, hold on, hold on. I got a plan because I'm living, right? <laughs> It's like, wow, like I'm still here 25 years later. Um, and so, yeah, so, I, so first of all, to be honest with you, it's a, it's, it's a privilege because the fact that I know that I came so close to dying and that I know more than likely that I'm not going to live to be 85, like my father and my mom is 83, um, that I try to make the most out of my life and enjoy things and stuff. Um, but I have also made a commitment to um, 
do my work until I'm 60, which is in 2024, because I do want to, because I figured by then, um, from 1998 to 2024, that's a long time, that I've done what I needed to do, right? And I've already left a legacy already in some of the organizations that I've worked with. Um, and I think that's the purpose of our lives, right? It's like, you know, you can go, why me? And why did this happen? And, uh, you know, I look at my name and my name means helper. And so I, I started to believe that all these things are happening to me so that I could be doing what I'm doing. And, you know, and just how the people I've met on my journey, like, it just felt so right. And to me, like being part of the transplant community is a privilege. It's a, we, we joke and say like, you know, it's a tough price to play, but once you're in there, it, this family that you have, like, you know, people who are just so thankful for life and they're not just saying it, like they really are thankful for life, right? But back to your question, I mean, none of us know when we're gonna die. I mean, this is, I'll tell you what happened when the 1992, when I came out of the hospital and the, the doctor said to me, I still have the note. He said, you either have primary sclerosis cholangitis or PBC, I was 28. He said, time you're 40 or 50, you might require a transplant. And the one-year survivor rate was at that time 70%. Three to five was like 50 or 40. Um, and those numbers have obviously changed. The one-year survivor now for liver is over 90. And you know, you know, I have friends who are almost like 40 years with their liver. Mm -hmm. And my friend says, like, why aren't you upset? And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm just so happy to know that what's wrong with me, that there is something. But I also said to her, I said, we were downtown Toronto and I lived in Barrie. I said, we still have to drive home. <laughs> you know, like I said, none of us, I mean, we could be in a car accident. And I know that sounds morbid, but it's a reality. Like we don't know. Sandra, what are you excited about for the future? What keeps you optimistic? I've been doing a lot of advocacy for organ and tissue donation. So if you, you looked up my name, which I think you did, um, that you will see me with a lot about organ and tissue donation because I've been part of that community for 25 years. And um, my goal was, first of all, to try to get donors registered. But then I realized it was like we needed people in the hospital to be prepared to do that and understanding how the whole system works. And that opened up a whole can of worms and stuff. So I've done a lot and still continue to do work with organ and tissue donation. But that's how I became a patient partner. And that's why I took the course at McMaster and trying to figure out how can I use all this lived experience that I've had? And, you know, it's been challenging and it's been hard, um, but I belong to an amazing community within the transplant community and even within the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And just anybody who survived an illness um, have a real appreciation for life. So how can I give back to the community? And so then I started looking at a lot of the areas that I was having problems with and all my experience was how our healthcare system is designed. And in reality, um, it wasn't designed for patients or caregivers. It was designed for doctors and facilitators and admin staff and that. So, um, and it definitely, there was no co-design involved with that. So I became a patient partner with Canadian Donation Transplant Research Program and there we got to identify, okay, researchers, you're doing this work, but why are you doing that work? Is that something that's important to the patients? No, it's not. Here's a list of what's important to the patients. So in the last six years, I've been able to direct, and I'm on the one part of CDTRP because there's lots of things. I'm on the long-term outcomes. So I'm able to say, well, you know, we want to focus on exercise and nutrition. We want to focus, nobody talks about mental health. You know, people are going life and death and nobody says, you know, how are you feeling? You know, they want, as long as your creatinine's okay with your kidney and your GFR is okay and your liver function tests, as far as the doctor's concerned, you're doing okay. So it was there I got to see, wow, you can make a real change. You mentioned co-design and patient partnerships. I know it's something you are very passionate about. Um, what have you learned about how to do patient family co-design well? Yeah, well, Co-design, co 
works when you have the right patient partner and the right uh, care providers and hospital administrators at the table. And not everyone, not all patients, uh, advocates can be patient partners because you have to get to the point where it's not about just you, but it's about the experiences that you had where you see that changes could have taken place or where you had experience that were good. Co-design is important because you're using all the people that make up the healthcare system and you're getting input and you're designing something that's gonna work for all, right? And, you know, I think, and I think that patients bring a lot more to, it's almost like, it's almost like one of my friends did down at Toronto General Hospital. He asked one of the doctors to make their way into the hospital through the emergency room and said, okay, where are you going? There was no signage, like, the real, like stuff like that. And so when the healthcare provider put their foots in the patient and what the patient experience was making their way through the hospital and, you know, how many times they were asked stuff and, you know, someone says, where do you go? And they go over there and you go like over where, like there's like, you know, and so those kind of things working together, I think just makes it more better. So, mm-hmm. but okay. it, it, it takes a good, it takes, um, you have to have the right people at the table to do it. You have to have an open mind. We'd like to end with, you know, what advice do you have for people who are starting this journey? So I think you need to be informed, need to be prepared, ask the questions, um, listen to the doctor's advice about what plans are available, but also see what else, what alternatives are, Um, you know, get the support from your family and your caregiver, Um, ask for help when you need it. Um, seek guidance, whoever that comes from, if it's a spiritual guidance or is it you just want to talk to someone or a support group, I think that's good as well. But I think, you know, you need to be empowered and you need to take a lead in your healthcare, and then, then add that, then be a team with your doctor and your, and your whole team and get them all working together and all communicating. <laughs> then I think we'll be successful. Awesome. You have definitely um, provided amazing advice. So thank you so much. Thank you. And all the best with the waiting room revolution. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. You're part of the revolution now. So you no, definitely. I'm on your team. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com to listen to our first season about the seven keys and to learn more. The podcast is produced and edited by me and Kayla McMillan. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketza. Please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast and help us get the word out.